for today, we'll be looking at the theorist um, Jacques Ranciere. Um, and he's actually become, um, Ranciere has become quite fashionable over the last 10 years or so. Um, so even though he was actually writing at the same time as many of the other theorists that we've been discussing um, recently, particularly in this last half, um, in some ways he's the most contemporary, um, uh, at least in the English-speaking world, because he's being discussed um, a lot these days. Now, while I'll be talking a lot about um, the nature of politics and of democracy um, in the class today, um, I'm not actually going to do much to relate these ideas to international relations. Um, I think the primary reading does a pretty good job of this, and I'm happy to discuss Roncia, of course, in this context in the tutorial. Um, but more importantly, I think, for me, is to get across the main uh, contours of Roncia's approach. Um, and to be honest, given the, the scope and given the sophistication of his ideas, um, I think we barely have enough time to get across um, the, you know, these, these, these main contours as it is. Okay, after looking briefly, uh, as usual, at his life, we'll consider the work um, of Roncia's teacher, Louis Althusser, um, who Roncia actually moved significantly away from, but who still, I think, informs Roncia's uh, uh, thought in interesting ways. And, and Althusser is someone who's actually uh, come up again a, a number of times in this course. He was friends with a lot of the people um, who we've been looking at. Uh, then we'll look at Ranciere's uh, view on the relationship between aesthetics and politics. Um, but the bulk of the class today is going to be on uh, Ranciere's ideas of equality um, and the implication these ideas have for the nature of politics and how this leads to uh, uh, his own particular view of democracy. Okay, Ranciere, Jacques Ranciere, like uh, Derrida, um, was born in Algiers, um, although 10 years later he was born in 1940. Um, and like Derrida, um, while he was, he was born in Algeria, he was ethnically French and French-speaking. Uh, so he ended up, of course, in France for his, uh, his university. And he studied at the Ecole Normale Supérieure uh, in, in Paris under the, uh, the, the tutelage of uh, Louis Althusser, the structuralist Marxist philosopher. Um, and he was at first a bit of a disciple of uh, Althusser, um, and we'll discuss this briefly uh, in a bit. Um, but later, he moved away from Althusser's views in some, in some pretty important ways. Um, in 1969, uh, Roncia joined the philosophy fel uh, faculty of the, of the newly created uh, Centre Universitaire Experimental de Vincennes, which became the University of Paris uh, 8 in, in 71. And he remained there, really, until his, his retirement in, in, uh, uh, in 2000. And he also served as professor of philosophy at the, uh, the European Gradu Graduate School in Sassfe in, in Switzerland. <clears throat> now, as I mentioned, um, Roncia started his, um, his academic career working uh, within the Althusserian approach um, of structural Marxism. Um, so I want to briefly look at this view uh, in order to get a sense of, I think, firstly, um, what you know, Roncia ended up reacting against. Um, which you know, illuminates the direction that he ended up taking, um, I guess in a kind of a negative way, um, but also gives a sense perhaps of, um, of some of the lingering influence of Althusser um, in this kind of subterranean way in his thought. So Althusser, basically, he has a view of Marxism um, that sees the state as existing in order to train people to accept the capitalist uh, status quo uh, through ideological mystification. So key here to Althusser's view um, is this particular conception of the word state. So for Althusser, uh, the term state is a little bit different than what might uh, immediately occur to you. Uh, so he's using this term in a, in, a, in a very particular, very Marxist kind of way. So state, uh, for him, isn't about public and private. Um, so we think usually of states as you know, doing things and owning things, and, and we separate this out from, from private ownership. Um, Althusser doesn't see things that way at all. Uh, so rather, he thinks that the state, um, operating in the interests of the ruling group, um, creates that distinction of public-private to begin with. It's not a real distinction. It's a distinction that's been created by the state. Um, because the state, for Althusser, it's more or less just the ruling class um, and the ruling groups and all of the institutions um, and all of the stuff that keeps them in power. And really from his perspective, 
almost everything is about helping these uh, ruling groups. So business, uh, religion, government, um, it's all about helping the state um, in the sense of helping the ruling groups maintain their control. So all of this stuff, all of these apparatuses, um, they're set up or they're mobilized for the purpose of the ruling group maintaining their dominance over society. So, I mean, one example, we often think of um, government and business as being these two separate things, these things that are against each other, that are opposed to each other in some kind of way. Um, and that's a pretty central um, discourse, I think, in, in contemporary politics. But for Althusser, that's just not the case. He doesn't see things that way at all. Um, they're both part of the same system. They're both working for the same people. So everything, uh, you know, the courts, the laws, uh, police, private industry, all of that stuff is part of the state. It exists to help the ruling groups stay in charge. So in this way, then, Althusser, he doesn't really distinguish between things like the legal system um, and popular cinema and the school system, including you know, universities um, and the government and so on. Um, it's all part of the same thing. It's all part of the state. <clears throat> But Althusser makes, um, I think, a pretty interesting further distinction. He distinguishes, distinguishes sorry, between two kinds of apparatuses that support the state. So we have ideological state apparatuses, and we have repressive state apparatuses. Now, according to Althusser, both of these things contribute really importantly um, to the ways that we live our lives and the way that society works. Um, they give us rules, they give us beliefs, and they give us systems and ideas that structure how we live our lives. So on the one hand, we have these, these things here, the RSAs, the repressive state um, apparatuses. Now these are the things that make us live a certain way um, by beating us up or locking us away um, or you know, doing things physically to us if we break the rules. Um, and you know, in certain ways, they're quite effective at this. Um, now, one possible reason why we don't, you know, redistribute wealth, for example, um, is because um, if we tried to do that, then we'd probably be locked up because the law says we're not allowed to, right? Um, so all of these things, you know, army, police, courts, prisons, um, they have the power to stop us doing things. So these apparatuses force us um, to do what the ruling class uh, wants us to do, um, forces us to act in certain ways. But I think it's probably fair to say that most people don't actually worry about these things, the army, the police, the courts, the prisons, in their day-to-day -day lives. Um, I think, at the very least, most people in this room, I'm sure, don't worry about these things. Um, now, there is undoubtedly um, usually a class and a, and a, and a racial element to them. Um, so if you're, you know, if you're poor and brown, then you're going to uh, you know, probably have much more to do with uh, these RSAs than if you're wealthy and white. Um, but generally, these RSAs, um, they're not really why we act the way we act. Um, so if I told you that there would be no legal consequences, um, how many of you would steal, you know, your you know, classmate's phone, for example, or how many of you would beat up someone who annoyed you? So no legal consequences. Who would, who would beat up someone who was rude to them on the bus? No, none of you would, right? Um, and how many of you weigh up these consequences in making that decision, right? How many of you think, well, I could, I could beat up someone on the bus, um, but if I do that, I'll get arrested? Is that, is that how you think? No, it's not how you think. Um, ordinarily, that's not how we make these decisions. So more important than these RSAs are the ISAs. Um, ISAs are really they're all the other things that teach us how to live our lives. Um, so the RSAs, they constrain us because uh, we're afraid of the threat of force. But with the ISAs, um, we act the way we do because that's just the way we think we ought to act. Right? So we've got religion, education, family, the legal system, the political system, the media. Right? These things, they teach us how to live our lives, um, how to live in, in, in certain ways. So what does religion 
teach us. Um, well, you know, it says look above you and, and defer to authority, for example. Um, how about education, right? So apart from, you know, th in this class, you're learning, of course, international relations theory. Aside from international relations theory, what are you learning in this class? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Time management. Um, things like, um, you know, meeting, yeah, meeting deadlines, um, fulfilling really make-work kinds of tasks, um, all these kinds of things that train you to be certain kinds of people, right? So, you know, turn up on time, sit in a room, you know, put up with boredom. It doesn't matter how boring my lecture is. You have to sit here and you have to listen to me and you have to learn to deal with that, right? You have to delay your gratification. Um, you have to follow instructions. Um, you know, that's for Althusser, that's the main lesson of this kind of class. It's not IR, it's all of these other things. Um, so you're here to learn to be good, punctual, obedient citizens. That's what you're here for. Um, the family, well, that teaches us to share. Um, it teaches us to you know, take other people into account, um, and so on. We could do this for all of, these different, um, all of these different ISAs. So all of these things teach us in different ways how to live our lives. And in doing this, Althusser thinks that they reproduce capitalism. <clears throat> now this was um, the mode of thinking called structural Marxism um, that Rancière was basically you know, intellectually brought up in. Um, Althusser was his teacher, and at the beginning of Rancière's career, he was a pretty dutiful student. Um, so the basic approach then focuses on the role of ideology um, in hiding the true nature of the world from us. Right? We can't recognize that we're being exploited uh, because, um, uh, of, in particular, I think, um, uh, the ideological state apparatuses that teach us that we're really in this situation of freedom and of equality. So the goal of structural Marxism is to help people throw off this ideological veil and see, how, uh, see things for how um, they really, truly are. In time, though, Ronciere um, came to reject this approach. Um, so he came to view, um, uh, or came to the view that, that, uh, that Marxism, and this kind of Marxism in particular, actually only had limited relevance um, to the social struggles um, that weren't based in class conflict, of which there were a lot. Um, and in large part, he came to this view because of the events of, uh, of May 1968 in, in France, and I've already talked about that a bit in this class, and Roncier, in fact, played a, an important role in these events. Um, now, one of the strongest arguments against his former teacher's view uh, for Roncier was that structural Marxism, um, or the structural Marxist view of ideology, um, was actually a conformist theory. Uh, so in other words, the right kind of maybe enlightened Marxists, such as Althusser, get to speak on behalf of the masses, right, who exist in this you know, view of ideology um, uh, as masses, right? Um, and this actually does nothing to undermine um, the hierarchy between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. In fact, um, uh, it ends up taking away the proletariat's voice and reinforcing this, um, this hierarchy. So Ronciere, he moved away from Althusser's view, um, though I think he kept in, in some subtle forms um, the idea of ideological state apparatuses, and, and I think we'll, we'll come to that in a bit. Um, but instead, he refocused his research on developing accounts of workers' movements in 19th century uh, France uh, drawn from the historical uh, archives. And this work aimed to tell the stories of workers uh, who refused to form, uh, sorry, refused to perform uh, the social role that was assigned to them. Uh, so he recounts the various ways in which workers uh, you know, claimed for themselves the rights that were previously reserved only for the bourgeoisie. <clears throat> so for example, he talks about um, the way that some workers attended the same plays um, as the bourgeoisie, and how this, this crossed distinctions between um, classes and, and categories um, in a kind of performative way. So this work, this, this basic approach he undertook here, 
ended up underlying the development of his own theories and his own politics. Um, so for Ronciere, the basic idea is that emancipation is a matter of transgression. Uh, it's a matter of performing actions that break, that contravene, the boundaries between different groups. So as a performance, then, um, for Ronciere, true politics is aesthetics. All right, it's about breaking down um, the, an established order uh, of, of things um, with one's transgressive deeds. Um, so it's a creative moment, he thinks. And in this way, he thinks uh, it's, it's like poetry. Um, poetry, unlike uh, probably most prose, it doesn't just utilize grammar. Right? At the same time, it also breaks with the grammatically determined uh, order and the function of words. Um, and we might even draw, I think, uh, some maybe extremely cautious and perhaps overstretched parallels um, between uh, Roncia and Kristeva uh, here and her, her idea of poetry getting at the semiotic. So he thinks, you know, politics is, is, is aesthetics. It's this transgressive, performative, creative moment. Um, but if politics is, is transgressive, or sorry, if politics is um, aesthetics uh, for Ranciere, at the same time, aesthetics is politics. Because aesthetics, he thinks, literature, art, uh, film, um, all these kinds of things, are able to blur the boundaries between fiction and reality. Um, and this itself, he thinks, is able to create the conditions for disrupting existing social hierarchies. So aesthetics as politics means allowing people to read and view and listen to things that allow them to consider the conditions, the real conditions um, of their existence, right? to consider their reality, um, while at the same time allowing them to think about possible ways um, of transgressing this reality. Um, so in other words, you know, this, is, this is the role of fiction. Fiction um, helps you to see the way things really are um, and at the same time imagine different ways of being uh, and ways that you can transgress the way that things really are. <coughs> now the most important concept for Ranciere, um, or for understanding his thought um, generally, is equality. Um, and in his view, um, equality diverges in some pretty important, uh, pretty, pretty important, pretty significant ways uh, from the standard use of this term. Um, in my view, I think it doesn't diverge as much from Habermas, perhaps, as, um, as even Ronciere thinks, um, despite superficially some, some quite big differences between the two, but, but for most uses of, uh, of equality, Ronciere differs significantly. <clears throat> so, in the standard view, equality is something that we're aiming to bring about. Right? We live in a world in which people, you know, different classes, different races, different genders, um, they're unequal. Right? So gender is unequal. Um, you know, people are treated differently based on sexual preference. Um, you know, races are unequal, and so on. Right? And our aim in this conception of equality is to move from the state of inequality to a state of equality. So we try to understand the ways in which equality is lacking um, in the present so that we can make things more equal in the future. Right? It's a pretty common idea of equality. It under, undergirds the liberal conception of equality and so on. <clears throat> For Ranciere, though, by contrast, equality is the starting point. So he assumes this state of equality as an a priori uh, assumption, right? So something that um, is able to be understood with the use of our reason alone. Um, so he recognizes, right, that inequalities certainly do exist in the world, um, but he thinks it's really important to focus on this a priori um, fact of our equality. That's the starting point. And in particular, he sees um, equality as a practice. So it's not something for the future. It's not something that we undertake, uh, sorry, it is, it's not something for the future. It is something that we undertake now uh, in the world. Equality is a performance. It's a practice. It's an activity um, that in the present unmakes social relations of oppression. So in other words, it's not some end goal, right, far off in the distant future that we, uh, uh, that we can eventually reach, but it's something that we actually do 
now in the present. It's a practice that we engage with or engage in um, in our lives. It's a way of making or, or perhaps unmaking the world around us um, by disclosing this already existing reality of equality, this a priori sense of equality. And Roncia thinks this is one of um, Althusser's missteps. Um, Althusser, he wasn't anti-egalitarian, right? Talked about lifting this veil of ideology, and talked about freeing people, he talked about ending oppression. Um, and so you can't accuse, of him, uh, accuse Althusser as, as of lacking genuine um, support for egalitarian social relations, like he was really deeply concerned with equality. Um, the problem with Althusser for, for Roncier was that he started off by noting inequalities in the world, um, in particular, of course, class inequalities. Uh, and Roncier thinks once you start from that position, uh, then equality is always going to be this future goal. Right? It becomes something that we work towards, but that we never actually reach. So Roncia's point is that equality is not something for the distant future. Um, it's not this elusive end goal that eludes us the closer we get uh, to it. Um, no, it's something that we, we practice now in the present. Uh, we act now to unmake hierarchies and unmake these oppressive uh, social relations. So we act in such a way as to disclose that equality was actually there all along. It was not there as a potential, but an actual fact. Equality was there underlying the fundamental social order. So Aronsia's basic idea then is that inequalities can only exist against a background of fundamental equality. Right? So the equality comes first, and then the inequality is placed on top of that. Um, now, this doesn't mean, as, uh, as liberals usually claim, that we're you know, all equal deep down and that society, you know, the social order, prevents this equality from coming about in practice. Um, this would just be another form of equality in potential. Um, be another instance of you know, kicking the, um, the, 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 the equality can you know, down the road um, and making it this ultimate but ultimately unachievable uh, goal. So the, you know, the idea with the liberals is that we're all potentially equal, um, you know, or equal in some abstract kind of ineffable way. Um, and as liberals, we need to try to bring about a world in which that potential equality is embodied in our social relations in actual fact. Um, and this is, this, is not, this is not what Roncy is saying. He's talking about the way that the social order, right, even a fundamentally unequal order, um, actually proceeds from presumptions of equality. Equality is the, the ultimate basis. So the reading draws attention um, to an example Roncier uses to illustrate this idea um, of a speech by the Roman senator Appius Claudius. So this speech was given to plebeians, to plebs, um, who'd, who'd gathered to discuss um, politics and discuss society. So Appius Claudius' speech basically explained to these plebeians um, that they had no business talking about politics and society. Right? It was the Senate's role to talk about these things. It wasn't the role of the plebeians, of the people, um, to talk about these issues. The interesting thing here, though, that Roncian notes is that Appius Claudius had to explain to the plebeians that they were unequal. Right? Now, if someone is fundamentally unequal to you, you don't have to explain anything to them, right? right? If Appius Claudius and the senators truly were above the plebeians, then there is no reason why they should have to explain anything to the plebeians at all. Right? The act of explanation only makes sense if the background assumption is that of equality. So my explaining to you that you're unequal is an act that actually confirms your fundamental equality. Um, and this is something, as I mentioned, that I've already flagged in the context of Habermas. Right? This is the idea of justification and the expectation of justification. 
So you don't have to justify anything to a rock, you know, a tree, or an animal. Um, you only have to justify things to equals. Um, so we see these massive inequalities all around the world. Uh, we see racism, we see sexism, we see all of these things. Um, but a constant characteristic of racism and sexism and you know, all these different kinds of inequalities is that it tries to justify itself. Right? And it doesn't just try to justify um, itself to itself, but to the people that it's claiming are inferior. Right? So if, someone, you know, if they were to say, look, there's this hierarchy of races, um, and you know, the reason for this is that your race is inferior to my race, well, in, in saying that, they're justifying the inequality. Right? Um, but if the person of the, of the so-called inferior race wasn't the speaker's equal at a fundamental level, no justification is actually required. Right? The very fact of justification discloses the fundamental fact of equality. You know, similarly, you know, women um, have been and still are um, treated as inferior to men, um, but they aren't just treated in this way. Um, this treatment is also justified with reasons, right, with arguments, um, with ideologies. But why is that necessary? If women are truly inferior, reasons, arguments, it's just beside the point. Right? Only if women are fundamentally equal to men, um, only if that's our basic fundamental starting point, can the, the act of justification make any sense at all. So only if women or non-whites or the proletariat um, are also persons, equal persons, capable of reason and understanding, um, only if they are equals is justification required to begin with. <clears throat> so Roncia's view, his basic view, is that we start with this fundamental basis of equality and then we move away from it. Right? And this is the core of his idea of politics. Um, and it's from this um, base that we can understand his idea of uh, police. Now, the idea of police for Ranciere is not just law enforcement. Um, it's all, um, or encompasses as well, all of the um, uh, procedures and allocations that divide society into groups. So it's all of the practices that determine um, who is a member of what group and what those groups are and you know, how they're represented and what they mean. Uh, so policing then, for Ranciere, allocates individuals to particular groups. Um, it's a process by which some people are made you know, working class, for example, with all that entails, um, and others are made middle class. Um, you know, it's the activity that, that, uh, that creates and that structures genders and races and so on. And at the same time as doing this, um, policing maintains the social hierarchies between these different groups. It maintains and it sediments this uh, social inequality. Now, I think this kind of takes us back a little bit to, um, uh, to Foucault, right? the idea of the production of categories and classes as this um, operation of a power knowledge kind of nexus. right? Uh, but also, I think this idea kind of harks back a bit to, um, to Ronsier's mentor, um, Althusser's ideas of the state. Um, and of ideological and repressive state apparatuses. Right? So uh, Ronsier, he doesn't separate RSAs and ISAs from each other. Um, he doesn't you know, separate them into two groups, which is perhaps, I think, justifiable. Um, because, of course, nothing is ever really purely an ISA. Right? Nothing is ever purely an ideological state apparatus. There's always some form of repression, um, some threat of force or threat of sanctions or so on. Right, even underlying the most, um, you know, ISA of ISAs. Um, for example, you know, like if you don't do what I expect of you in this course, then you know I fail you or something like that. So that's that's a that's a repressive tool, um, even though most of what goes on in this class is is an ISA. And by contrast, too, um, RSAs are not purely repressive. Right? We don't 
obey the police, um, for example, purely because they can throw us in jail. And uh, we also usually respect the authority that police have. Um, you know, most of us, I think, most of the time, give them the benefit of the doubt, uh, of the doubt even when perhaps we shouldn't. And so Ronsier's idea of police and policing um, can perhaps be a thought, uh, thought of as a, as a combination of these two ideas of I ISAs and RSAs and the recognition that they're not quite as separate as Althusser uh, wants to claim that they are. And then we have Foucault's insight, of course, that, that uh, power and knowledge go together, that the way we categorize and divide uh, things is itself an important operation of power. And we have, you know, Althusser's, as I said, his conception of the state um, in this broad sense, um, uh, you know, both the ISA organs and the RSA organs working together to maintain and to reproduce and to sediment a certain unequal, oppressive, hierarchical uh, system of, of social classification. <clears throat> so we have this idea that the background state of any society, no matter how unequal that society is, um, is actually one of fundamental equality. Um, so that's the first idea. Then we have the idea uh, of police or of policing um, as a means by which this equality is hidden through the procedures and the allocations um, uh, or, you know, by the activity of, uh, of the state. So policing acts to make things unequal or make things seem unequal um, through constructing and maintaining uh, these classificatory systems and by placing people into these classifications and into these categories. <clears throat> right, so those are, the, those are the key ideas. And this gets us finally to what politics really is for Ronciere. The kinds of activities that we usually associate with politics, um, so voting, you know, even protesting, um, debating, um, these, for Ronsier, they're not what is essentially political. Instead, Ronsier suggests that the political is only seen in those quite rare moments um, in which people act to disrupt these hierarchies um, and to confirm in the act of disrupting these hierarchies the fundamental equality that is always there that underlies society. So he captures this idea of politics in the term subjectivation. Um, so subjectivation is, to put it you know, in, in, in simple terms, the situation in which individuals create a space where we can see and appreciate the underlying, the fundamental equality that runs under our society. And this involves, for Ronsier, most importantly, a process of disidentification. Because um, remember, for Ronsier, we're policed into identifying with the categories, with the classifications. So we're policed in such a way that we're accounted for. Right? We're categorized, we're classified, um, and we're thereby given an identity in this wider system of hierarchy and equality. When we engage in sub, uh, subjectivation, though, um, we disidentify uh, with that classification, with that identity. Uh, we escape the categorization um, that's been given to us. We escape the roles that have been assigned to us in this wider social system that controls us and that oppresses us. And in doing so, we assert to society that we need to be recognized as equal. Um, that the fundamental nature of society is one of equality rather than one of hierarchy uh, and oppression. <clears throat> now, interestingly, and I think perhaps again um, reminiscent of, um, of Habermas, subjectivation involves arguments about already um, existing inscriptions of equality. So for example, we have this idea of universal human rights, right? Um, so these are rights that are inscribed already. 
Um, and they're presumably, in theory, uh, inscribed universally. Everyone, you know, all humans have human rights, right? Um, and it's tempting to treat this inscription of human rights as kind of an end in itself. So we say, look, you know, we've invented or perhaps recognized um, these amazing things called universal human rights, and so now everybody has all these rights, and so everything's amazing. Um, now, of course, this is not how things actually work in practice, right? Uh, and Roncia points out that inscribing <coughs> rights is not enough to make these rights a reality. Now, furthermore, he thinks, rights cannot be given. Because if you're someone who can be given rights, then you already have those rights. Because you've already been recognized as the kind of being to whom rights apply. Um, so those people, the people who are given rights, they're not the issue for Roncia. They're not the interesting case. Um, rather, it's the people who aren't covered by those rights as a matter of practice, right? Those people who aren't entitled to exercise power, um, who are actually in most need of those rights to begin with. So rights are not this thing that can be given to the worst off, the people who are the worst off, um, the very people who are you know, most oppressed and who are most dominated, um, the, you know, the people who don't count in our society, um, because someone who already counts, or only someone who already counts, can be given rights, right? Only someone who already counts can be given rights. And if they already count, they don't need to be given rights because they already have them. Instead then, Roncia thinks that rights are something that need to be taken. They need to be asserted by the people who are the worst off, by the people who aren't covered by rights. So to put things in another way, if you're already recognized as a subject, you have rights, right? If you're not already recognized as a subject, it doesn't matter how much people say, you know, yay, universal human rights, everyone has universal human rights, because you're not an appropriate subject of those rights. Only by asserting the subject who is not recognized as a subject, um, so, sorry, only by you know, those who are not recognized as a subject asserting that they are a subject through this process of subjectivation, um, can you gain rights. Um, yeah, so only by, uh, you know, those, for those people who are not subjects, for those people who are not covered by rights, you can't be given them, you're not a subject, um, and only subjects can have rights. So you need to assert that you are a subject. And if you successfully assert that you're a subject, then by definition you have rights. Now, of course, the issue here is not that um, uh, you know, these people who are not subjects um, demand particular rights. Um, the issue is that by insisting on particular rights, they demand the right to be heard generally. Um, and the right to be heard is this really important thing for Ronciere. Because once you're granted the right to be heard, then your equality is recognized. You're recognized as being a subject. <clears throat> so this then is, for Roncia, the idea at the heart of democracy. Now we usually think of democracy as certain institutions, um, so, you know, a parliament or a legislature of some kind, um, you know, the right to vote, um, the existence of this robust public sphere, you know, maybe a division of powers, um, uh, you know, so on. Um, for Roncia, no, these things are fine, but they're secondary. Uh, democracy, th he thinks, um, at its core, is a situation in which those who do not count, right, those who have no right to exercise power, are able to do so, um, are able to assert themselves and are able to assert their equality. So it's a situation in which such people, people who are not counted as subjects, are able to rupture the order of legitimacy um, and of, of domination and of hierarchy. Um, you know, in other words, that they're able to unmake this hierarchical classification um, and these orderings and these accountings and so on that make up society um, and that are policed by the state. 
<clears throat> so, for example, you know, when, when women or when working people or when immigrants or you know, whoever are not being recognized as subjects declare themselves as equal to the ruling class, then we have democracy for Ranciere. So how does this declaration take place? How do we make this declaration? Well, according to Ranciere, those who aren't recognized as subjects declare their equality by setting up a dispute between them and the ruling class over the fact that already existing principles are not enacted universally. Um, so, for example, they say something like, look, you claim that we all have universal rights, but I don't see that in practice. Now, once again, though, I want to emphasize that it's not a matter of asserting these specific rights, but a matter of um, of people with no formal right to assert these rights um, doing so through disputing the application and the scope of these specific pre-existing rights. Um, uh, and in doing so, they can come to be recognized as a subject in the first place. So in other words, the very fact of disputing with the ruling groups disputing really anything, it doesn't matter what specific rights we're talking about, but the very fact of disputing is itself an assertion of equality. Because if the ruling groups recognize that you have a right to argue with them, to engage you know, in a dispute with them in the first place, then regardless of what the content of that dispute is, they're at the same time recognizing you as an equal. So that to recognize someone as having the right to argue with you is to recognize them as an equal. And this recognition for Ranciere is the key thing. That's democracy. So this activity, right, this assertion of equality through the act of disputation, through the act of starting a dispute, starting an argument, um, Ranciere calls a dissensus. Uh, so it's an act of coming together, right, an act um, that recognizes fundamental equality, but not through working out you know, working out some specific problem like you find in, in liberal um, systems, um, and not through consensus. Right? It's not about bringing everyone together and agreeing, um, but it's bringing everyone together, making everyone equals through the act of disputation itself, through the very fact that you're able to argue. And this, Ronsier thinks, that is democracy. Democracy is dissensus. It's not a form of governing for Ronsier. Um, instead, it's this ever-present possibility of this unpredicted subject emerging um, and creating a space in which equality can be claimed through the process of dissensus. So, what we consider... Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's interesting. Um, can other things become subjects? They would have to be able to engage in dissensus, is the thing. So you could think about um, if, an, if an AI was developed and the AI engaged us in dissensus, um, maybe that would count. Animals would be trickier unless they were able to communicate. So I think, you know, there's a sort of a... Yeah, to argue, you have to be able to communicate. So you have to be a communicating subject. So in that regard, even though... Ronsier actually um, doesn't like Habermas. I think he's a lot closer to Habermas than he you know, actually credits. Um, but yeah, I think in AI, um, so it doesn't have to be human, but it does have to communicate. Mm. So yeah, the basic idea here is what we consider usually to be democracy, well, Ronsier is actually quite scornful of. Um, in fact, he, he actually has a book that's literally called Hatred of Democracy. Um, so he's not, he's not a fan at all of modern liberal democracy. Generally, though, um, he identifies three forms of democratic politics that he considers um, deeply, deeply problematic um, that he calls archipolitics, parapolitics, um, and metapolitics. So archipolitics, it's a form of politics uh, based in a communitarian uh, school, communitarian way of thinking. Um, so the basic idea, if you haven't encountered communitarianism before, is that a political community is based around a homogenous group. 
right? So ethnic nationalism, for example, um, is, a, is a case, or an instance of communitarianism. Um, and the reading notes that actually our old friend um, Carl Schmitt is, um, is, is kind of an extreme example of this way of thinking, because um, for, Sch uh, for Schmidt, right, um, the world is fundamentally divided into friends and to enemies. Um, so enemies are this absolute other, um, and there's just no possibility in the final analysis um, of reaching common ground with the enemy. They are just the enemy. Um, so this is an absolute divide. Now the problem with archipolitics, Voronsier, um, is that it doesn't allow for the possibility of an outside. Um, because everyone who matters is already included in the polity, right? Um, so those who are outside um, a communitarian society, an archipolitical society, um, by definition cannot be included. They cannot count. Um, so the border between inside and outside is a strict one. It's an absolute one. Um, and this is a problem for Roncier. So in, in such a politics, um, in archipolitics, Roncier thinks, um, true democracy is, is just not possible. It's, you can't have it. There's no possibility of people who are not already recognized as subjects being recognized as subjects. It cannot occur. Um, an enemy is just an enemy, right? Um, an outsider is an outsider. Someone who's not the same you know, ethnic group as you is just not the same ethnic group as you. Um, and there's no common ground on which dissensus can be built. You're just, you're in or you're out. The second problematic form of, um, of uh, politics, uh, Roncia calls parapolitics. Uh, so parapolitics, uh, unlike archipolitics, recognizes that social conflicts do exist, um, but it also shuts down the possibility of true democracy um, by turning the possibility of dissensus into a mere practical problem of governance. Um, so there's no possibility to assert equality against the police because that essential, you know, dissential kind of politics is transformed into merely a matter of how we should organize and govern society. So, for example, if I were to say, you know, uh, that conflicts exist in society, uh, but that conflict is transformed purely into a matter of which party gets to appoint the prime minister, um, or which party gets a majority in parliament, or, or whatever, um, then we're engaging in parapolitics, right? Um, and I think this is something that's pretty obvious in our current moment in New Zealand. Um, you know, I mean, by pretty much any measure, um, young people in this country are getting pretty royally screwed, right? Um, but when you point this out, uh, one of the most common responses is, well, you know, young people never get out and vote, so it's, you know, it's your own fault, right? Um, but, you know, I think Ronsi would want to say this lack of voting is a symptom, it's not a cause. Um, right, the fundamental issue for young people is that they're not recognized as full subjects by the ruling groups. Right? So when people say, you know, well, young people should vote if they want change, um, they're transforming what's potentially a matter of dissensus. Right? The possibility of young people asserting their fundamental um, uh, equality against the police into a mere matter of governance, a mere matter of uh, party politics, of voting, of the way the system works. And we might say the same kind of thing about the Māori seats, for example. So speaking as someone you know, who's in full support of the Māori seats, um, they're also at the same time, uh, according to this parapolitical view, something of a red herring. Um, because the issue of Māori representation in New Zealand is not a matter of whether they have or don't have specific seats um, that only you know, people on the Māori role can vote for, but a question of whether Māori are able to engage in a dissensus that asserts their equality um, to uh, the ruling groups. Um, so making everything about the Māori seats um, transforms this truly democratic possibility, this possibility of dissensus, of you know, the assertion of fundamental equality um, into a mere matter of governance, into a mere matter of the system. Finally, for Roncier, we have metapolitics. 
Um, so if archipolitics is characteristic of uh, communitarianism and parapolitics is characteristic of, of liberalism, then metapolitics is uh, characteristic of um, certain forms of Marxism, perhaps also feminism, um, post-colonial uh, politics as well. So metapolitics um, is undemocratic, according to Ronciere, because it claims that subjectivation can only happen in certain places. Uh, so for you know, pretty unreconstructed Marxists, politics is about the working class and the, the struggle of the working class. You know, for feminists, politics is about the patriarchy um, and the struggle of women against the patriarchy. And for post-colonialists, you know, it's about the struggle against colonialism and the struggle against racism. Now, if we take any of these lines, then all of the other struggles cease to have any significance, right? And so it ceases to be possible for anyone who's not already recognized as a subject to engage in the process of subjectivation. Because, uh, you know, the whole point of democracy is that it's about the unexpected and unpredictable assertion um, of equality by people or by, by groups. And if we've already, if we've already decided before we even begin to engage in politics, what counts as politics, right, and what kinds of things matter, um, then this unexpected assertion of equality um, is just foreclosed from the very start. And therefore, you know, for Ronciere, democracy, true democracy is also foreclosed. Okay, almost out of time. Uh, we've got to finish, though, don't we? Okay. Um, of particular concern uh, to Ronciere uh, is what he calls consensus uh, politics, which he says is, is the dominant form of politics in our current moment. So consensus politics, um, he thinks, is the ultimate exercise in turning any conflict into an addressable problem. Uh, it's, it's, it's obsessed with, uh, with public opinion and with polling, um, and in focusing on this idea of consensus, um, it prevents real disputes, it prevents real dissensus um, from ever actually developing in a society. So instead of allowing um, uh, the possibility um, that conflict can disrupt and to overturn existing hierarchies, uh, consensus politics just makes every disagreement a problem that can be addressed within the existing hierarchies while leaving those hierarchies basically intact. So there's no possibility of resisting the police no possibility of upsetting the smooth functioning of the systems that maintain these existing hierarchies. Um, and hence, um, you know, well, yeah, because as soon as you start to disagree in this kind of system, um, your disagreement is turned into a problem that's solvable within that system. And so that disagreement ceases to have any truly democratic potential. Now, perhaps worse for Ronciere, um, Consensus politics doesn't just make every disagreement into a solvable problem, but it solves that problem by the addition of minority rights. Um, so politics becomes, then, um, about the claiming of more specific minority rights, uh, and as a result, it really just completely reinforces existing identifications. So rather than this identifying, and thereby disrupting and, uh, and transgressing the police, the only political path is to identify more with your existing group, and therefore with the, you know, with the status hierarchy as it currently exists. As a result, demands by minorities for additional rights, um, Roncia thinks ends up leading to a society of inequality. Um, not because different groups end up with different rights, right, as most right-wing criticisms of this, um, of this kind of politics claims. Roncia doesn't take that line at all. Um, but rather, because this situation leads to people being forced to identify with their social role um, and their social identity, right? And therefore, forecloses any subjectivation and any possibility of dissensus. And it's only through the possibility of dissensus that we can find true democracy, he thinks, and, and the assertion of real fundamental equality. Okay, so we'll finish there. Um, as I said at the beginning, we can talk about Roncier in the context of IR specifically in the, in the tutorial. Um, for the time being, you know, I think let's just try and get a handle on his basic approach. Um, on Thursday, our final lecture of content, we'll look at, um, at Paul Virilio. Uh, 